Second and third tools of monetary policy, discount window lending. Traditionally, Federal Reserve Banks lend to commercial banks secured by collateral at a rate known as a discount rate. <coughs> the issue here when you use the discount window is what kind of collateral do you present and how is it valued? The Reserve Banks will typically take a haircut to um, guard against the risk of the collateral that they're holding. It's only overnight loans typically, so there's not much risk. Um, but all of that is changing. Second tool of monetary, third, or rather the third tool of monetary policy, reserve requirements. Again, I told you that uh, deposits that commercial banks hold with reserve banks are called reserves. A portion of those reserves are known as required reserves. And there's a percentage relationship depending on the type and the amount of deposits that a commercial bank has, it keeps a fraction of those deposits as reserves. So this creates a lever, if you will, depending on how many reserves a bank has in its account with the Fed, it can have so much in deposits and then can make so much in loans. That's what banks do, they take deposits and make loans. Reserves, therefore, are kind of high-powered money, and that's how we think about it. If the reserve requirement is 10%, for example, a dollar of reserves will support $9 of deposits and $9 of lending. So there's a, a kind of leverage factor in terms of reserves. Now, five years ago, if I were going to talk to you about the tools of monetary policy, I might have talked a little bit about discount from their lending, although not many banks were borrowing for the Fed, from the Fed because there was a real stigma associated with it. If anybody found out you were borrowing for the, from the Fed, you probably uh, would be thought of as in a failing situation or close to it. And I surely would not have talked to you about reserve requirements because they've reduced to almost nothing. However, with the current circumstances, the Fed is using all of its tools. With the financial and now economic crisis, monetary policy uses a broader array of programs <coughs> and all of its tools. As was probably pointed out last week, the traditional tool of monetary policy, the Fed funds rate, as we saw on the chart, is now down effectively to zero. It can't go any lower. But that doesn't mean that the Fed can't help in this crisis. In fact, it's used its balance sheet, and that's, that's why I asked you that question about the balance sheet before. It's used its balance sheet to be very innovative. How is it being innovative? It's using the other two tools of monetary policy, mostly the lending one, um, and it's developed some new capabilities uh, in the market-based area. On the lending side, used to be only lend to banks, only lend overnight, only lend on more than a fully collateralized basis. Now short-term credit up to 90 days is provided to both commercial banks and primary dealer investment banks. And it's not just a straight out loan. Uh, a lot of the money is going out on an auction. So it kind of takes that stigma of borrowing from the Fed together. You've, you've bid on an auction from, for money from the Fed rather than gone to the Fed for a loan. Fed made loans to facilitate the acquisition of Bear Stearns by JP Morgan. It made loans to AIG. All of these are fairly complicated. The collateral they took in was collateral that in normal times they probably never would have been able to take. But these are not normal times, these are crises times. There's a provision of the Federal Reserve Act called Section 13.3, and the loans that were made to Bear Stearns and AIG are called 13.3 loans. Finally, swap lines to foreign central banks. Foreign central banks needed, needed dollars because of the dollar liquidity needed by banks in their countries to meet the same kind of financial credit crises uh, that we have here. Um, in a swap, you lend dollars and you get the foreign currency uh, on the other side. So the swap arrangements we had, which had been very limited and really not used a whole lot before, have uh, blossomed into several different currencies uh, as a result of this financial crisis. 
Reserves. How to change reserve requirements. Well, one thing that's happened here is that formerly those balances used to be interest-free. So obviously banks got them out of the Federal Reserve as quickly as they could to put them to some use that made some money. Even though they were high-powered, you know, the trade-off was I could make some money on these balances. Now they earn an interest rate. Um, and this has helped keep some uh, enough enough reserves on the balance that it's made the Fed's management of uh, the Fed funds rate a little bit simpler. And this is why they did this last fall to change um, a long-standing practice of not paying interest to paying interest on reserve requirements. And finally, a whole host of market-based programs. Rather than usually in open market operations, what you do is um, either buy or sell a treasury security. What the Fed is doing now is basically buying up certain kinds of securities in separate programs that are run in different ways and financed in different ways, but all have one common element. They put liquidity into markets that are otherwise frozen. So liquidity went out to the commercial paper market, particularly the asset-backed commercial paper market when that froze up last fall. Money went out to money market, mutual funds, to buy up some of the assets on money market mutual funds books that were proving very dif difficult for the money market uh, funds to actually buy, uh, sell in the market. Buying up government, the GSE debt, Fannie and Freddie debt, and mortgage-backed securities, again, putting money into selected markets, in this case, the mortgage market, to free that market up, take securities off that market that weren't so liquid, and put money into the market that then could be used for new lending. And finally, a facility that's just starting up this week, it was announced last November, it's starting up this week, it's called the TALF. Now, you're going to hear a lot about TALF in the next few weeks, T-A-L-F. Term Asset Liquidity Facility. My view is that this facility is going to have um, a significant impact on credit at the ground level, credit to you. If you want to buy a car, if you want to get a small business loan, if you want to um, have a decent rate on your credit card. What the ter Term Asset Lending Facility will do, it will buy up securitized student loans, auto loans, credit card loans, small business administration loans, and with a revision that's just been put into it, more and more real estate loans, both commercial real estate loans and residential uh, real estate development loans that have been securitized. Again, for the purpose of putting money in those, into those particular kinds of markets freeing them up, taking the securities off, and ultimately either holding them to maturity or holding them until they can be sold. And some of these um, lending facilities are being done both in partnership with the private sector, i.e. the private sectors put some money into it, or with the treasury, the treasuries put some money into it. So this is a, a very, very innovative set of new programs um, that the Fed has been pursuing. So it's clear how the Fed has been adding liquidity to the markets from this chart. Now this starts, um, this chart starts in December of 2002 with Fed credit, that is the asset side of the Fed balance sheet at around $700 billion. It goes along, you know, at a pretty stable pace for a while. And then in September 17th of 2008, it shoots up to over $2 trillion. That <coughs> reflects the liquidity that the Fed has been putting into the system, both through open market operations, i.e. taking down that Fed funds rate, and through all of the other innovative programs that it's been engaging in, you're putting money into the economy, you're adding assets to the Fed's balance sheet, and it's ballooned up from a little bit over 800 billion 
up to 2.3, 2.4 trillion, and recently it's backed off. Now that backing off is a really good thing. That backing off suggests that some assets have matured, and that the Fed has not found it necessary to put replacement money into whatever market the asset has matured from, because that market is actually starting to function. And you are seeing um, some easing up of the credit crisis. But this, I think, is a very um, dramatic um, way to try to understand all the work that the Fed's been doing. So when we talk about the stimulus plan in fiscal policy, it isn't just fiscal policy that's been stimulating the economy. Think what things would be like if the Fed hadn't done what it did. Think how difficult it would be without this roughly trillion and a half infusion of liquidity into our credit markets. Okay, so the Fed's been part of the answer. It's been part of the solution to the problem. It's certainly part of how you should think about um, what the government's been doing to stimulate the economy. But was the Fed part of the problem to begin with? Did they cause some of our current situation? As I noted when I started this um, talk, this is a problem near, to dear, near and dear to my heart since I was on the Open Market Committee. During the period of time, one could argue, if the Fed were part of the problem, you know, I was there. <laughs> anyway. First answer to this question, yes. Interest rates were too low for too long during a period of time when asset prices were escalating. These lower interest rates affected prices, both at the consumer level and the prices of real assets, like houses and financial assets, like stock. GDP growth slowed in the early part of this century, 2000 to 2003 or four and policy eased with it, but asset prices soared at the same time. With interest rates low, investors borrowed more and more to buy these higher and higher priced assets and took risks with new financial instruments that they didn't really understand. So interest rates being too low for too long is part of the problem. Here we see kind of an interesting chart. There's a lot of stuff on here. The blue line is rising household wealth. Household wealth is financial instruments and it's prices of houses. And you can see the escalation that occurred between 1992 and 2008. This is basically based on um, the flow funds data. The bars reflect the effective rate, Fed funds rate. So that's a measure of policy. And the red line is the consumer price index. Now you can see as consumer prices, excluding food and energy, what are called core consumer prices, went down after the recession from 2001 to 2003 or four or so. As consumer prices went down, policy eased as well. It was a period of slow growth, slow employment, so policy was looking to be more looking to be easier to add liquidity into the economy. But look at what was happening with asset prices at the very same time. Was the Fed's interest rate policy part of that? You could say yes. You could also say no. Inflation was low. Economic growth was slow. That's the Fed's job. The Fed's job is to match its policy, match its interest rates to the growth levels of the economy. Remember I told you about that inflation growth trade-off? So the Fed is trying to do its job by not raising interest rates, which it believed would slow growth even further and keep unemployment higher than it otherwise needed to be. The housing boom may have been helped by low interest rates, but it was really fueled by demographics and by financial innovation. And moreover, the problem of low interest rates was not just a US problem, it was an international problem. It was fueled by 
countries that were very much net savers, in particular ch uh, China, and the flows of savings from abroad increased the supply of worldwide liquidity, which impacted interest rates here and other places as well, and kept the demand for securities and real assets high and kept the prices high. Okay, so um, we look at this chart again. We still see that um, poor consumer prices were low. The effective uh, rate on federal funds was low. The Fed was trying to do its job well while asset prices were escalating. I guess a companion question would be, if the Fed had looked at those how, at growing household wealth and growing asset prices, how high would it have had to take interest rates in order to stop that escalation? And how palatable would that have been to anybody? You don't even need to be a politician to worry about this one. How palatable would that have been to anybody? For the Fed to say, we know better than you what the value of your house should be, or what the value of your stock should be, in an environment of otherwise slowish kind of growth and low inflation. Okay, so we can say yes, we can say no. I come down firmly on the side of maybe. <laughs> I think there's some reason to believe that interest rates were too low for too long, and that we telegraphed too much of what we were going to do, and we did it in too little of a process, and we provide too, too small steps. Remember all those little steps up and up? Um, and we provided too much certainty when the market would have been better off with a little more uncertainty. Moreover, the Fed is also a regulator as well as a monetary policy machine. We are a bank regulator, we're a consumer regulator, um, we could have done more, <coughs> hindsight being 2020, on the mortgage brokers and the kinds of things that were going on, particularly uh, after um, 2005, 2006, that really uh, ratcheted up the level of subprime lending in this country. But we're still stuck with that question, how to deal with asset price versus consumer price escalation and how one knows how hot to take interest rates. Come back to our chart again. We've seen it all. Okay, so what's happening now? Financial markets remain in disarray, but as you saw, that little downturn in the Fed's balance sheet won't be downturning for very long, given the new things that are gonna happen, but um, that downturn reflects some easing up in credit markets, and you can see this um, in interbank lending, you can see it in the uh, residential mortgage rates last fall, October, November, when the Fed said it was going to buy mortgage-backed securities and GSE debt. Um, interest rates came down in, at 100 basis points for a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage, all, literally uh, within a week or so. Um, and that has um, started the mortgage markets to work a bit again, if only on the refin refinancing side. And commercial paper markets have stabilized. If you're a small <coughs> company, if you're not investment rated, if you're anything below AA, you can't borrow in the commercial paper. You probably had trouble borrowing in the commercial paper in any paper market in any event. But if you're a top rated company, you can now borrow both corporately and in the commercial paper market. So there's been some little easing up, I would argue, in the financial markets, although looking at the stock market from day to day, you can't tell that. And Economic growth is pretty much stalled. Um, you know, we're probably looking at um, another, at least another couple of negative quarters and some more bad numbers on the employment side and the unemployment rate going up probably close to nine. Deflation is a concern that <coughs> ratcheting that we talked we've talked about in other sessions. Fed funds target remains effectively at zero. There's some good news. And that good news is that monetary policy, I believe, has been unusually innovative and various programs seem to be working and probably will be expanded in the days to come as we see what happens with uh, the financial security plan 
um, that um, is now getting worked out hopefully in more detail. This was the subject that uh, Secretary Geithner talked about a couple weeks ago and it landed with such a thud um, everywhere because it's very complex, it's hard for people to understand. Uh, hopefully when it comes back again um, it will be understand a little, understood a little bit better. Uh, but I think that um, the Federal Reserve will have a role to play in that and it will again be expanding its balance sheet. <coughs> the not so good news is this, this process has been slower than any of us would like. Um, it's complicated and, and it's uncertain. And frankly, I think, and actually Chairman Bernanke gave a speech about this today. Um, I think we need, someone needs, and I think the Fed is working on this, you need now to start worrying about how one goes from a two, two and a half, or even three trillion dollar Fed balance sheet down to something that is more normal for uh, an economy once we get ourselves uh, out of this um, fiscal and economic mess. That we have the financial, I should say, an economic mess we're in now. So thank you very much. Hopefully that was um, a little bit of a primer on monetary policy. Now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to um, introduce our second speaker for this evening, the Joseph Meyer um, Professor of Political Economy at Harvard, Professor Benjamin Friedman. Um, he's gotten awards many too many to name. Um, He's written many, many things, I couldn't possibly name them all, but I am going to point out to you this one book that I personally love. It's called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. And for all of you who have been sitting through our classes, this is something you really should read. It's a great combination of philosophy and economic history, um, and it deals with all the subjects that we've been dealing with in this class. So without further ado, Professor Friedman.